So you've got a very nicely formatted data set. You've got your metadata as well now. Um, and now you need to get that data into Afrobis. Okay, so this is to talk about how we go about getting data into Afrobis. A little bit of background first about uh, the Obis network, um, about what we have in Obis uh, from Afrobis now, and then a bit more specifics about um, how you can go about providing your data to Afrobis um, and even um, uploading it onto Afrobis's IPT server. Okay, so first of all, um, Afrobis isn't the only node, it's part of a, a global network of uh, nodes um, and Obis is the strategic alliance of all these uh, uh, institutions and networks and data providers. Um, we have um, a number of Obis nodes um, from all over the world uh, at the moment. Um, Afrobis is really only supposed to represent sub-Saharan Africa, but at the moment it's representing the whole continent. Um, so, new nodes are welcome to propose joining the network. <laughs> yeah. Non-sub-Saharan. Non okay. Okay. My knowledge of those things. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, so we have. Um, sort of regional nodes that are geographic and we have re some nodes that are thematic so uh, we have things that are specialized uh, about corals, uh, specialists about fish, specialists about sea mounts, we have Orbis Sea Map which specializes around um, um, sort of marine megafauna and, and seabirds. Um, so th that's, that's uh, uh, Afrobis fits into that network of nodes. Um, now my job as international obvious data manager is to harvest the data from all of these nodes on a regular basis and build it all together into a single central database. Um, we do some quality checking when we build that database, but it's nowhere uh, as thorough as the, the quality checking you need to do. We expect the data to be of good quality when it's submitted to uh, the OBIS network. Um, so. Um, at the moment, the recommended place to get data about Afrobis data is to actually come to the IOBIS portal. Um, that's partly because poor old Ursula doesn't have the time and resources to, to invest in her own portal, Afrobis portal at the moment. Um, so the best place to come is to Afrobis because we've gathered that information anyway from Afrobis's IPT server and we've also gathered it from other members of the OBIS node network, which also may have data that actually occurs around the coastal waters of Africa. So by coming to IORBIS, you'll get the benefit of that combination of data from everywhere. Um, okay, so just a quick uh, note on the nodes. Afrobis is at the top here at the moment. Um, this tells you um, by all the different nodes we have the number of data sets and the number of records. So at the moment, we've got 31 data sets from Afrobis, and that's just under 3.5 million records. Um, as a whole. You can find all of this out already on IOBIS, but the, there's a list of the 31 data sets um, from various places. Um, so just a quick recap, what do we mean by a data set um, that you submit to Afrobis? Well, it's a, a resource containing a grouping of uh, data records which contain at the very minimum those OBIS mandatory fields that I said yesterday, so the latitude, longitude, the scientific name, and the details about the institution, those three codes. That's, that's the minimum. Um, you can also represent a lot more using the OBIS schema and Darwin Core. Um, now that resource might be a very big data set um, from a large database or an entire museum's collections or it might be very small um, such as associated with just a paper or a thesis. Um, we're interested in everything. Okay? So there's no restrictions on the size, small or large. Okay, very important to remember the metadata. Okay, so one of the uh, issues with that last exercise was that um, in the biodiversity data set, where was the accompanying metadata? It wasn't there. Okay, so you have to think about that. Um, the metadata must contain at least the title, the citation, a point of contact, um, keywords, and usage restriction ideally. 
Um, but the metadata, that can contain other information as well. The richer the metadata, the better. Okay. So, having covered all of that, what's the procedure for publishing data? Well, we have this conceptual flow of information that the data owner, if somebody in your institute perhaps, or another institute, gives you the data provider, their data set um, to publish, and then that is passed on to the regional or thematic nodes. In your case, that would be Afrobis. And then we as international OBIS collect data from that, from the thematic or regional node. Um, so the data provider is a person or an institute submitting data to be included in OBIS, and that may well be different to the data custodian or the collector of the data. Um, the OBIS nodes uh, are responsible for quality control of data sets and the transfer of these to IOBIS, uh, although the quality control is also, to some degree, the, um, uh, the job of the data provider, which is why we've been uh, quite thorough on the data quality. Um, now, it should be noted that the OBIS nodes won't edit the content of your data sets that are provided to them, um, but they can be consulted for quality control issues um, as well as the data provider if they arise. So they're there for help and advice. Um, so you have your data, your metadata and your occurrence data. Um, we assume that you have got um, your data or metadata, you've quality checked the data now, uh, and you've formatted the data if necessary. We're, we're now assuming that that's all happened. Um, you can provide your files directly to your OBIS node um, if you wish. You can provide the metadata in any kind of text file format or word processing document. Um, the data itself can be in a CSV or tab delimited file as long as we have it structured, that's good. Or it can be in an Excel file. And very simply, make that available to Afrobis. Ursula's given her contact details. You can email it if it's bigger than that, place it on an FTP server perhaps, or place it in a Dropbox folder. Just make it available and Ursula can collect that. Um, but better still, there's another way you can provide your data and that is uploading it onto the Afrobis IPT server, um, which we've kind of mentioned about before, but I'll, we'll have a look at that now. So, um, Just quickly, before you would upload your data set to an IPT, you need to make sure that there's one field per column. You've included the mandatory OBIS fields, um, but also you need to think about the OBIS schema because this data will go into OBIS. Um, I have a document describing the OBIS schema. And you also, if you're uploading it to IPT, you need to consider the Darwin Core fields as well. We talked about Darwin Core yesterday um, because you have to map fields to the Darwin Core using the IPT. What that means is um, that you may actually, uh, if you put your data set on IPT, you may find that there are more columns in your data set than are in the OBIS schema. You can still map those fields if you, if you wish using the IPT. It just means that they won't get included in the OBIS database because they're not part of the OBIS schema. Yeah? But you have your data there on an IPT server. It doesn't mean that, it means that other people, other institutes, other scientists can come and collect get that data set that's well formatted, quality checked from that IPT server if you point it to them as well. So it's not necessarily just for OBIS. You can give those links out to the resource on an IPT and to other people as well. But OBIS comes along and it deals with collecting the information in the fields mapped to the OBIS schema. Okay. Make sure you've quality checked your data set. Resolved any quality issues by communicating with your data provider. Um, and then we come to uploading the data set to the IPT. Okay. So there's a few preconditions to publishing your data on the IPT. You should be associated with a data collection or a data collecting organization, which you all are. Um, you should be publishing a data set about specimens. <laughs> okay, uh, we're going through this, these preconditions to publishing data. This is a very important one, uh, this third one down. You hold the rights to publish the data or have permission from the rights holder. Don't go publishing data without, from a scientific paper without consulting the originators of it. 
you need to make sure you have the right to publish the data. And then you kind of, by publishing the data, um, you're giving a commitment to maintain the data set and improve its quality where possible. Um, and you're also willing to provide or find out that metadata so that everybody can learn what the data set's about. Once you've gone through that checklist, you're ready to publish your data. Um, there are issues around um, the licensing of data. Um, ideally, you would publish your data under something called the Creative Commons license. Um, and I hope this is going to be touched on. If not, we might have to cover it um, a little bit later on. But um, we strongly recommend publishing under a license called C uh, Open Data Commons Attribute License. I think it's CC BY now, rather than ODC BY. Um, and it allows the, the free use of your data, but it requires that your data set is cited upon use. Um, there are uh, a list of other possible licenses with their pros and cons and uh, caveats that's available on the Canadensis website. Um, that's a link in this presentation, so you can follow that link uh, when you get the presentation and have a look at those. Okay, so the IPT server um, that you would publish your data set to. This is the URL of Afrobis's IPT server. Um, it looks like this, and you can see at the moment there are four data sets on IPT. Um, so not every one of the 33 data sets in IOBIS has come from IPT. This IPT is a relatively um, recent kind of been adopted by IOBIS as a way to make data sets available. Although there are other data sets that would take some time to be migrated onto this, perhaps, or, or I, I'm not sure, but um, it's a, it's it's a bit of work to put data sets onto an IPT. Um, so these are a newer data sets uh, that Ursula has already created on there. Um, okay, the IPT publishing process. So um, you take your database or your spreadsheet, you get your information out of it, we expect it. It needs to be put into some kind of delimited text file um, and then um, it's uploaded onto the IPT server and at that point um, we add metadata and we map the fields within your data set to Darwin Core. There are a lot of fields in Darwin Core, you'll see this in a moment. And finally, once you've added the metadata, done your Darwin Core mapping, you can publish that and make it publicly available as a Darwin Core file. The Darwin Core file contains your occurrence data in Darwin Core format with Darwin Core column headings. Um, and it also contains an embedded metadata file within it. And it also contains um, a list of the columns because everybody's data sets are different. They won't all contain the same columns. They'll contain a different list of columns and potentially in a different order as well. So all of those two descriptive files are, are there with the occurrence data. And that is downloaded as something called the Darwin Core Archive, which is a zip file with those three files within it. Okay. Okay. Okay, so to be able to create and manage your own data sets, you need to get in touch with Ursula, who's your Afrobis Afrobis node manager, um, and she needs to create an account on her IPT server for you to, to log in. Um, once you have your account, you can log in at the top of the IPT page. Um, now, I should probably go through this um, as a demonstration. So... Um, I don't have an account yet for the Afrobis IPT server, so I'm going to use a different one um, for a different Obis node just for demonstration purposes, but uh, it's, um, the IPT is the same. Let me just get Firefox off. Okay, so I'll just bring up the, the Afrobis IPT server. It's not very fast from here. Okay. Oh, it's coming. It's coming. But, okay, that's the Afrobis IPT server. 
Um, there's another IPT server that I'm going to demonstrate with, and this is Obis Canada's, but you don't need to worry about uh, this. It will be faster because it's actually hosted here in this building, so that's why I'm using it. Okay, Obis Canada just looks a little bit different. They've put their logo in the top, but it's the same thing. It has a few more data sets on it than Afro Obis, but um, we have somebody that's been using it for um, quite a, a long time. Um, so, you need an account to log in as. Um, again, get your account from Ursula. Okay, so I've logged in. Once you log in, you'll see your email address or your account appear at the top side, um, and you'll get a few more buttons at the top. The one you need to click on is this Manage Resources button, um, and then you get a list of all the resources that you have the right to manage um, or modify, and usually these will only be the ones that you've uploaded onto the server. Um, okay, so. We're interested in creating a new resource, and the first thing you have to give it is a short name. Um, so this is uh, pretty important. It needs to be uh, um, a little bit descriptive um, about your data set. Um, it's not quite the same as the title, but um, this short name gets carried forward through this IPT into the Obis database. Okay. I'm going to give... Uh, if, you, if you're creating a test data set, it's always a good idea just to prefix it with the word test. Um, and then you can go through the whole, you can delete this test database off the IPT server and you can create a new one with a better name. Um, uh, okay. And I would only use. Um, I wouldn't use any special characters in there, just use underscores um, if, you, if you like. Um, the type of data set, um, IPT has a, a number of ones, but we're interested in occurrence data sets. Um, so we're going to select occurrence down here. Um, occasionally you'll be lucky and somebody might provide you a Darwin Core archive already. <laughs> it's pretty unlikely. If you do, you, could, you can use this uh, to select an existing Darwin Core archive. but we are going to assume that it's not in Darwin Core Archive format, and then we're going to click on Create. So I've created my um, data set now. I can um, upload my source data, um, and I can add metadata here. So if I click on the metadata, it's the first thing we're going to look at, and click on the Edit button, you'll see that I have fields, a whole bunch of fields here for basic metadata in Darwin Core that cover a lot more than we ask as the minimum in Obis. Um, so the short name that I use comes through by default into the title field, but I can uh, give that a better title, a more descriptive title. I wouldn't recommend using your name, <laughs> something. Um, a description, so... Um, this would be effectively what you put in the in the abstract for your data set. Um, I'm not going to fill that out now. I'll just type some text in there. You can even specify the language which the metadata is in, um, and the metadata in which your resource is 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 uh, in. And subtype can be um, observation or specimens. If you if perhaps if you are uploading details about museum collection specimens, you can specify it here. Or if it's observations data, then you can specify it in there. Then you get the ability to add in um, a resource contact. So I'm just going to put in my name in here. Um, and you can fill in extra information there. And there are other 
other contacts you can add in here so the resource creator the person that created it the, who provided the metadata uh, it's possible to copy those details so I'm just going to quickly copy those in and save now okay um, then I can go through and add extra metadata information such as what is the geographic coverage of my data set I can just do that by dragging and dropping these in I can add, provide details on the time um, the taxonomy keywords um, the sampling methods a lot of other stuff if you're willing to put that in there that's great um, just add it in um, but you don't have to um, okay so I'm going to cancel out of that um, notice before uh, it had a red um, some red text there indicating the metadata wasn't complete so but that's gone now um, so I, I've added my metadata Pardon? Um, good question. Everything that has a star here. So in in the IPT, it's the title description. Um, if you add a contact, um, last name and organisation and position. Um, I will create another one if you like. Um, so I go to my manage resources um, and I put in the word Mike. Okay, I'll get my data set if I. I'll just create a new one. Again, I'll do bad practices here. <laughs> Okay, if I try and edit that and save that, it should tell me what's missing. Okay, so it's um, uh, it's all already put in the title. Um, if I was to take that out, I'm sure that would be a problem as well. The description um, and a contact here for um, contact for the resource and a contact for the resource creator. It seems the, the the missing fields that it needs. Okay, um, I'm going to cancel that one. In fact, and just delete it. I can delete my whole Darwin core by just pressing delete. And come back to the one I wanted. So it's not something you have to do um, all in one go either. You can do little bits to this before you want to publish it. So you, you don't. You know, you can fill in a part of the data and come back um, and save it and carry on. Um, my source data, I can browse to that. Um, now I'll go and try and find um, I'll use the same biodiversity data file that was provided. I've called it something else here. Um, Okay, so I've got it as a we've got it as this tab delimited text file. Um, I will find the well formatted um, data set here. Okay, um, and hopefully this is going to work. Okay. If I click my the add button afterwards, um, it's going to um, determine the number of columns in there, um, the number of rows. Um, I can click on the preview button and get a preview of it, um, and you can see that all of the um, it's it's worked out that it was a tab delimited file. It's worked out that it's got the the header row at the top and all of the data in columns. So you can have a quick preview of it um, there. I think I must click the back button to get out of that. Um, so again, I've, I've, I've told it where the file is. I click on the add button. Um, it's already uploaded it. I don't want to overwrite it. Um, okay, so now I come to the Darwin core mapping section of it. Um, and it's a Darwin core occurrence file. That's the only option I've got. If I click on add, um, it'll tell me what is my source data there and if I save that 
Okay, then I come down to this um, this part down here, which is the Darwin core occurrence. Okay, so the first part is this thing called occurrence ID. This is the primary key value from the database we're we're calling it. Um, so I think in this one, well, I can use line number, I guess. I haven't actually looked at the data set. Um, so that's the, the core ID um, there. And then I get all of these record level terms. Now, the Dar this IPT is kind of intelligent enough that if you name a column with the Darwin core field name, it will automatically pick it out here. So it's picked out the institution code column, the collection code, the basis of record there. Um, I th um, so what I'll need to do is I'll need to open up the data file in Excel and just check the fields that we have um, there. I'll just save that. Okay. So it's not essential to map every single term here um, to what's in your data file. Um, so for the occurrence. Um, it's picked out the catalog number, the sex, the life stage. I just need to make sure, in this case, that my latitude and longitude in the location fields um, are mapped. So come down to the location. And as you can see, there are so many, so many, so many fields here that it's a bit full on and confusing. Um, so here we go, decimal latitude and decimal longitude. So um, all of these terms on the left hand side are the Darwin core terms and in here it's giving you a list of the columns that are in your own data set. So I will map my decimal latitude to latitude and decimal longitude to longitude in my file. So this is just a, a mapping tool mapping from your data set to Darwin core. Um, so I've done those fields. Um, save that. Okay. Uh, and it gives me a problem. Decimal latitudes are mapped to values with the wrong data type. Okay. Why that is, that's indicating potentially a problem in the data set. Um, okay, so maybe my corrected data set, which has got commas in it um, is a problem there. Sorry, I hadn't uh, checked with this data set before. Okay, so, but you get the idea. You're mapping between the, the fields in your data set to the Darwin core terms. Um, at the bottom of the page, it'll give you a list of the columns that you haven't mapped, so you can see if you're missing any, if you're missing any of, the, of the columns uh, in your data set that you haven't mapped to, the, to a Darwin core term. Um, once you've mapped the columns, um, you can. The next step after you've mapped your columns is to publish the data set, basically, um, and make it publicly available. So once you've done all of this um, mapping, uh, it's not automatically available to everybody. You have to actually take the step of publishing it onto the IPT so that it's available publicly. Um, Okay, um, I shall go back to my PowerPoint. Okay. 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 So, um, oh, some guidance on the when we create the data set on the short name. It should be unique. It should be descriptive. Um, there's no need to include your node name in the in the short name. Again, good examples, slightly more descriptive than the ones on the left there. Um, okay, creating your resource on the IPT. Make sure it's an occurrence data file. Um, create, create. You get to the resource overview where you can put in your metadata, do your mappings. Um, this is where you do the publishing. So by default, it's uh, private. Uh, once you've created your mappings, 
um, you can publish it and make it a publicly available data set. Um, the easiest way to get your data uh, into the IPT is to export it as a delimited text file. An important thing to note is you, it needs to be in UTF-8 character encoding um, for your export. So that could have been one of the problems I just had. Um, and it's not ASCII or Mac or Windows format. Um, to avoid the misrepresentation of your, your special characters, um, you should include a header line in that exported file, otherwise you'll have trouble mapping the, the columns because all you'll see are data values in that list where you do the mappings to Darwin Core. Um, you need to upload your data set. Um, you may um, even use compressed files to upload your data set if it's a big data set. So you can upload zip and gzip formats. Um, more detailed instructions than I'm going to give you now, you can find in the IPT user manual. Again, there's a link to it there. Um, okay, you, can, you get your preview to preview the file once it's been uploaded, um, and then you map your fields to Darwin Core. Okay, so again, in this presentation, we give you links to the Darwin Core standard and all of the defined terms. Um, this mapping is that's the most challenging part of publishing your data on the IPT. Um, as you can see, even on when I was looking at it, the list of the Darwin Core terms can be quite overwhelming. There's so many of them, um, and it's difficult to select the ones that are appropriate for your data set. We've got uh, a document I'll provide that gives the OBIS schema and the list of uh, Darwin Core terms. Um, it is a work in progress uh, as well, and some of those terms even we're unsure about, I have to say. Um, so we are here to help you in that circumstances. You know, can get in touch with us if you're having problems mapping your data set to Darwin Core. Every Darwin Core, every data set's slightly different. It has different fields and different um, potential um, mappings. Okay. Um, make sure you add your metadata. Again, the IPT manual uh, has detailed instructions about using the metadata man uh, editor, and finally, publish your data. Um, okay. Once you publish your data, your data set gets listed on that home page that I showed you, and then you can notify anybody that you wish uh, who have an interest in your data set. Okay. Um, it's important to note that the IPT isn't a quality control tool. It will up, it will publish your data. Um, with uh, bad data in it um, and it's a static snapshot of your data and it won't change until you upload a new file. Okay, it does allow for versioning of your data set so if you were to uh, provide version 1 if you, if you re-upload that again it will allow you to version it to version 2. Um, Okay, a final word is IPT is actually a, a, a product of GBIF um, and it offers you the option to register your data with GBIF directly. Um, by doing that, your data becomes directly available via the GBIF data portal. We recommend that you don't register your data set with GBIF because ultimately your data that comes into OBIS will get provided into GBIF anyway. Um, so if you register your data set with GBIF directly, it will probably cause some confusion and may even lead to duplication of your data set between GBIF and OBIS. So we recommend that you don't register your data set with GBIF. Um, there are other methods that you can use to publish data. Uh, uh, there are some guidelines there on how that can be done. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank um, Canadensis for that guide to publishing uh, OBIS data and I'll make a, a six-step guide available to you so that you can have more details about and a guide that you can use while you're doing it. Okay. But that's everything. Um, that's kind of like a, an overview and appreciation of what's involved in publishing your data on the IPT. Um, if anyone's got any questions, let me know. Uh, yes, you can delete a data set, but you can delete a data set off an IPT. Yes, but I mean... It's out, once, it's, once you put it on IPT, it's out there in the public domain. So people can... Once it's been picked up by OBIS, then you can delete it. Otherwise, OBIS will 
Yeah. But you can correct. If you do, you mean in terms of creating a test yeah, data set? Yeah. Oh, you can. Re you, yeah, you version it. Yeah, I wouldn't say delete it. You just create a new version. Yeah, so it can be replaced. Yeah. Yeah. So if you submit it to IPT, it will automatically go into OBIS. Yes, OBIS will harvest all of the data sets on the IPT. Uh, you just upload a new data set. Yeah. And then you have to. No, no, you'd upload the full the full data set again, not just a, like an increment. You'd have to upload the whole thing. Yeah, it replaces the previous whole thing. But then you have to yeah. Uh, I think it retains that history of versions in, in the IPT. It, it will display the most recent version, but it will keep a history of it as well. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I'm afraid I'm not. I'm not an expert in this, so uh, um, I'd have to. I'll have to get back to you on that one. If you, if you want to know, uh, I'll have to get back. So you can see that there is there is a version I remember. I don't think you can necessarily get to that version as somebody that's that's uh, downloading it or specifying it, but I think that on the server itself, for the person that's maintaining the server, it probably it will store that version in an archive that you can potentially go back to. So it's not something that you can go, okay, give me version one from 10 years ago of this data set. I don't think you can do that. But you just have to replace data set. You, you go to the, you keep all the metadata the same thing and you just say yeah. this, is, this is version four. Well, I'll check that out. Um, I, I can't do this, and I don't want to do it on Opus Canada's IPT yeah. server, but I'll, I'll check it out um, and, and let you know. But um, I can't manage the resources on here that Mary's created, um, so it's something I'd need to have a look at and get back to you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 We'll, we'll find out in a minute. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> what would you put a citation for a data set that hasn't been published in a paper? It's, there's not necessarily a cruise report. You know, as a yeah. It's, it's, it needs to be done in that kind of style, but you, can, you have to, um, I guess, uh, be creative. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... You can say a data set, you know, give the, the person or the project name or something as, uh, as a start. I would just say use an academic style citation as a, as a template, but rather than the title of the journal, you give it the data set title that you would put in, perhaps, um, and the institute name, and so it and gives the, credit to those. The title of the data set would be the title of your article. Yeah, but if you... So you, so you could, 
it's not static. No, no, but the, you, have, you have data set, you have data set type. So yeah. here, for example, study uh, of blah, blah, blah. You can add, you can create a, a citation. Probably. Is it even in there? Here you go. Citation. Citation. So, so it is. It was not. It was. It was also not published in a, in a journal. Eh? So you have the odd, the person Andrea Hawks, 2014, the the title of the the data set, and then the publisher is Bedford Institute of Oceanography. Yeah. Published by Obis, accessed on. There are formats, proposed formats for data sets. Yeah. yeah. becoming more and more common practice as well to, to put a data set citation in their reference list in scientific papers. It's like publishing a data set is now considered the same thing as publishing a paper. You cannot, it can also be cited, uh, you can get metrics out of it, but in the research just like it's not considered a paper or Often they use the RPC if it's an open research and not the, the data set for proponents. They typically scientists to actually start publishing the data. Um, as an incentive they say because uh, some of the scientists are measured against the amount of academic papers that they publish. And so publishing the data without having published, they usually keep the data back. So using the RPC and publishing a data paper as opposed to just an academic paper is also they're trying to implement that more easily so that scientists also get recognition for the data that they're publishing. Like like worms has a citation a data a database citation, and if you if you track how many times it has been cited, it has been cited over a thousand times. So uh, if you if you want to show if you want to build up your CV, you can say, look, I publish a database that was cited more than a thousand times. If you have a scientific publication that has been cited a thousand times in your, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's very highly, highly ranked. Yeah. Almost lunchtime. Are there any more questions about the RPC? I think it would be good by the end of this week if we could manage to get a few data sets ready and upload them when we upload the RPC. So I'll just I'll show you the document uh, that I've got for mapping the Obis schema. So we have I'll, I'll provide this one. It's an Excel file that uh, shows you the Obis schema and um, the Darwin core fields that they map to, and also where there's a bit of uh, ambiguity. <laughs> uh, like I say, this is a a, a work in progress. Um, Okay, uh, so this spreadsheet will give you uh, the OBIS field name. So this is the field that actually exists in the OBIS database that we can map values to, um, uh, if it's required or not. Some notes about what it is, whether it's a date, time or not. And if I scroll across, uh, this is the what we call the ratified Darwin core term um, here. So the field you'll see in Darwin core that that should be mapped to is called modified. Um, if I full screen this, so there we go. Um, so uh, just so you know, the white cells are where we've or everybody agrees on the mapping. Um, you can see here that the institution code, collection code, and catalog number are marked as required fields for Orbis, and they map to the same fields in in Darwin core. Um, same names. Not every field maps to exactly the same name, um, but we then get uh, areas of ambiguity. Or we are these 
color-coded cells are where we still as a group in Orbis discussing what they should map to. Um, we recommend that you probably do use these for the moment, um, but again we need we may well change those uh, in the future. Um, so there are a few of those. Many of the core things like kingdom phylum and all of those taxonomic fields are all pretty straightforward. Uh, note that the species doesn't match to, map to a field called species in Darwin Core, it's called specific epithet. Um, the month and the dates, we now, rather than mapping them to individual fields, we prefer those to be mapped into individual fields using that ISO, date, ISO 8601 format that we uh, talked about earlier on. Um, so this is a kind of a guide for you to use, but there are, as I say, there are some areas of uncertainty um, for some of the fields. Um, so again, we are here to be contacted uh, in those cases where you have problems. Uh, again, this is all to do with the, the date that the observation was collected. Um, again, there are notes on the right-hand side to say we don't use that anymore or don't recommend using it. Please use ISO 8601 in a field called event date. That can cater for all of these possibilities. Um, so I'll provide this file in some supplemental reading type folder for you. Um, and this can be used as a guide for doing that mapping in the IPT server. Um, it, it will be... Um, uh, I say it's a bit painful process to do the mapping, but um, with experience and trying it, uh, you'll get used to it, and you also get used to understanding the Darwin core terms as well. Um, there are not necessarily every field in the Orbis schema um, maps to Darwin core, um, or so you may have additional uh, fields that don't map that you might want to get into the Orbis database that. Um, and there's a field there called dynamic properties, um, but that means you have to kind of concatenate those values into a string separated by some kind of delimiter to indicate that they are value pair information. Um, it's a bit of a bucket that people use for throwing in other information at the moment, um, but if it's in the database, we can parse that and, and pull information out in the future. So it's probably useful to know about that one. And there is a notes field as well, uh, which maps to a current remark, so you can give notes at record level as well. So that can be used as a tool um, to help you when you're doing the mapping from Orbis to ratify Darwin Core in the IPT server. That's that. That's it. I just wanted to show you that as well.